Hello, everybody. This is Bill Bittner from IBM. Uh, here we are in our last session of a, a very full week uh, here at the VM Workshop. Uh, and presenting now will be Glenn Schneck from GT Software. Uh, he's covering the challenges integrating legacy Kix applications. Uh, so with that, Glenn, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Bill, and happy Friday, everybody. Uh, I realize I'm standing between you and Friday happy hour, so I'll try to make this as painless as possible for you. Uh, like Bill said, I'm going to be talking about some of the challenges that we have encountered uh, trying to create APIs for legacy Kix applications uh, with some of our customers. As we're all aware, the Kix is the system of record for many industries. Uh, and we'll talk about a couple of them um, in particular, uh, things that we've done, but uh, between banks and insurance and transportation, medical, it, it's everywhere. And 71% of the Fortune 500s are using mainframes. 87% of all credit card transactions are handled in the mainframe. So what is today's challenge? Today's challenge uh, that we see is that there's a vast amount of information on the mainframe that people want to be able to present to mobile, web, uh, iPad, or other types of, of um, front ends. So how do we get from the front end to the mainframe and back? Um, one of our uh, sales guys likes this slide because he likes Legos apparently. And basically it's a building block and we're, we're the final building block between the front end and your mainframe data and applications. Now we're going to talk about a little bit about the complexities that we've seen um, in our um, in our quest to create APIs. Everybody thinks to create an API, it's easy. Well, if it was that easy, everybody would be doing it and nobody would have any problems with it. And I'm sure that um, some of you may have tried it uh, and have come into some issues. Um, but we all know that it's not the easiest thing in the world to do. There's different ways to approach it. And we're going to talk about those also. And one of those is writing code. There's many uh, organizations that decide to write code. And um, the, big, the big problem with that is who's going to support the code coming forward? And wouldn't you like a solution that you didn't write any code and you still can create effective APIs? Another way to do it is that you try, you fail, and success. Try, fail, and success. So if you're going to do this, you might want to do it where you can do the, the, the different tries, um, different changes quickly and easily, again, without having to write code and compile code and stuff like that. So first thing you do is, do you have the main, right mainframe technology? Well, how old your legacy back end, back end uh, applications? Well, that depends. Depends on your definition of legacy. Changes to made to a program in 1975 when uh, no, no newer technology exists. How about needing the flow and decision making in your uh, APIs? What kind of technologies are you using? Is the application code structured or unstructured, or is it both? And we all know that every programmer follows coding standards. But then again, whose standards are they following? I don't think I've ran into one company that has a coding standard that has been followed since the beginning of their application. And what 30 third party components are you embedding in your code? A lot of the banks have Telon or something like that. How do you handle that? Do your core applications first start out as a commercial, app, commercial offering? I was at an organization before I got on the vendor side that had a big distribution warehouse application. They, they uh, changed it so much, customized it so much that finally the, the uh, company that had the uh, commercial offering said, look, why don't you just buy the software off of us? We'll give you all the code and you can handle it yourself because you're making so many changes, we just can't do it anymore. So you have to think about that. Well, how complex is the code and your data structure designs? And do your support teams fully understand the application? And this goes back to um, everybody talks about knowledge being lost. Who understands their, who, who understands their application fully as, as an application programmer? Probably not too many people these days. 
do you have the right mainframe technologies? There's a lot of technologies out there over the year that have been used to attempt to create successful API environments. Some are real time, some are near real time. If you look at this list, everybody probably has a, a, at least one of these type of technologies, even if it's your own homegrown components. Understanding your application and APIs. Well, is your application a 3270 based application where you can't really just go into a, the screens? That's the way they were developed originally before people did uh, separate the presentation and the, and the application logic. Integration technologies that you use should be transparent to the back end. And by that, I mean the back end shouldn't know who's requesting the data, how they request the data. They should just be able to supply the data. Changing legacy code to make your API work better. What we do, what we do here at GT is, is we give you the opportunity to create your APIs and not change your legacy code at all. One of the uh, examples I have is that uh, we're working with a, an airline that has code that um, we looked at and I actually, I saw it with my own eyes, I couldn't believe it. The code was originally written in 1976. We were able to create a API for them without them changing a single, single line of their backend code. You have fine grain APIs, we call them microservices. And we'll get into this a little bit long, uh, a little bit later when you talk about um, your philosophy on, on whether and how you want to create your APIs and set up your, your environment. More intelligent APIs, less effort for the API consumer. And we'll talk about this a little bit. Um, we'd, like to, we'd like to talk about getting your applications and, and doing APIs for your application is like a box of chocolates because you don't really know what's in there until you go in and start poking around. Okay, some of the complexities that we talk about. Your, your, your flow in your, in your application may do a couple program calls, then a transfer control. Do you really need to know that for your API or you just need to know what you need to come in and what you need to come out? You can have multiple input or output messages and we'll talk about this a little bit later too. Um, your messages could be variable length or, or multi-part, or they can have different layouts. How do you, how do you handle that? Or you could have uh, some redefines and an ODO in your code. How, how did you handle that? Null terminations. We ran into a situation where uh, on the data, they had a three fox as a null terminator. Well, in three fox, you, you put that back out to the front end and it's like ampersand asterisk alpha three or something like that. So we had to figure out a way to get by that so we could, we could present the data as it uh, normally is. Does your 3270 have screen macros? Do you use, do you use macros on your, on your dialogues? Do you have any conversational dialogues? How are they handled? They have to be handled a little bit different. And what about any external application to 3270 applications? Other 3270 applications, can you look at a, at a screen that doesn't have a BMS map and how do you handle that? And then you have a complexity of your transactions. Uh, and we'll go over that a little bit um, where a transaction can come in and depending on what the data is, it goes one place or it does, does, or goes a different place. And how do you handle all that into your API, especially if you don't want to do any coding? One of the things that we, that we offer or we have available is a thing we have called the application analyzer. And this is a really cool product that it, it does not like an X-ray into your environment. You put, the, you put all your code in there and it has like a hundred and some parsers. So you can go from an XML document or a JSON document all the way through to your uh, mainframe COBOL, does Java C or whatever. And you can say, if I change this field and this copy book, where does it affect the entire flow of my uh, application or my API. We talked about before about uh, microservices and how they affect the front end uh, consumer applications. Here's an example. Uh, and I worked at a bank for a while and we had um, some of this that we brought in. Uh, we actually brought in Ivory to, uh, to do this. Where I may be at the bank and I have multiple 
um, accounts. I have a checking account, a savings account. I might have a car loan. I might have a 401k there, a mortgage. Well, in order to get that information from the mainframe as a front end application, I have two choices. I can either call at, call each one of the microservice APIs and then have each each AP, each uh, consumer on the front here write code or or have to affect effectively compositize those APIs into a single result set to pass back and display on the uh, on the mobile device. Or you can have something in the middle. And this something in the middle is 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 what I'll, I'll show you later on in a, in a hopefully a quick demonstration, where we can just say we're going to create an API called Get Customer. The front ends call Get Customer, so they don't have to come back to the mainframe. We'll take care. We take care of all that. We take the um, microservices, pass back only the data that we required for um, the front end. We can, we can create it into one API and a composite or a smart API, and that's what we pass back to the front end. So if there's a change back here, you change it one place as opposed to making your consumer front ends all change the uh, thing. I see a question, uh, am I referring to ZOS only situations or ZOS and VSC? We, um, we don't care. We, we do kicks on VSC and we do kicks IMS on uh, ZOS. So yeah, we could we could do both. We could do a combination in a single smart API. We could do a combination of getting data from different um, different sources. Go back again to reinforce what I was talking. Uh, you can have an API manager here, but that's all nice, and it can go back to a single microservice with a single input and a single output, and you map the input to the output. And this says REST, but we do SOAP and REST. So uh, if you want to do SOAP, we can do that. If you want to do REST, we can do that. And again, you have an API manager and you have the API processing logic, which would call each, if this is multiple uh, microservices, they'd have to call each one. So what we do here, as you can see, we put Ivory in the middle and they could still go and call that single REST API if they want. If you, if you already have APIs created, okay? Um, but what we allow is a business process flow. And the business process flow is pretty powerful because we can actually do uh, some data manipulation. Uh, in one case, we had the front end looking for a date uh, in a certain format, but the data in the back and the mainframe had the data in a different format. And Ivory is able to, to you by a function, using a, a function node, we're able to format that date to whichever side needs it, to whatever format they need. Flow and control. Uh, this is unique to us without writing code, is we can do if, then, else. We can do a switch case um, logic. So it's all part, again, it's all part of the business process flow. What about message switching or different program calls? Here's some of the stuff we talked about before. Multiple input and output messages. Uh, what if you're, uh, you have like a single uh, application and depending on the input and what you want returned, you use a different copy book. How would you handle that um, in, a, in a programming type situation, the front end? We handle it for you. Um, again, we talked about um, Occurs depending on redefines, null terminations. We talked about that. Screen macros, um, and I and it, it I, I have this MFS in here um, because we do do IMS um, on ZOS, um, but we also have like third-party applications that do 3270, uh, like IDMS and Natural. We can we can do IDMS and Natural through the 3270 screens that they present. We can also do multiple transactions. Um, I know in the one situation we have that the real data came from the fourth transaction in the flow. Well, if with, without having this business process flow, you'd be calling, calling them back each time. You call the first one, get some information, call the second one. With the business process flow, we basically take care of that uh, behind the scenes. Okay, the composite and business APIs we've been talking about for a little bit. Um, 
we used, uh, I reused the process paradigm to drive interaction with the legacy systems. That's transparent, transparent uh, in, any, in the way that we design them. There's no modification of le legacy code and the API is developed in the, um, and we'll show you the, the studio, it's called the Ivory Studio. It's a drag and drop environment. We also have a wizard to get you started with your um, APIs. So the resulting smart, we call smart API makes it much easier for the consumer app to have real time information as opposed to, to them getting the information and then having to write the code to get that, that the real time information. As part of your business process flow, you could also call out to an external service. Uh, this could be any, any API, REST or SOAP, that is external. A uh, couple, couple customers, one is a um, testing service that if anybody's ever done a, a GED or GMAT or uh, SAT, those kind of testing services, when you sign up for them, they want to know your look. They they want to know where you're located, and they also need to process your credit card. Well, they used Ivory as for as part of their process for the scheduling, where they will call out to Google Geocode to find the closest testing location to you, and the same the same process they'll call out to do your credit card verification, uh, all through Ivory and, and the use of external services. One of our insurance companies uh, has to provide uh, insurance data to um, Highway Patrol from different states. So as part of their app API, they've created a call where they can go and um, have, the, have the FHP call in to um, them to check the verification. They also had a situation where Somebody changed your name, got married and changed your name, and there was like five or six or more places in their system where the name had to be changed. And when they do that manually, they had to go to each one of them to update the name. By using Ivory, the, the customer updates it once and Ivory processes all the changes in the background using APIs to their, to their mainframe. Here's a look at um, one of the one of the uh, actual APIs that we created uh, for the airline, and what happened here is that depending depending on what was returned, actually, but this this was a uh, an IMS one, but they returned a full blob of data. It could be one page, it could be a hundred pages, but each page could be different size, and we were able to use our switch case technology that says, hey, if this is the copy book that's coming back, run down this leg and then go back and check for more. Or if it's this one, this one, this one. And here's a catch all saying, I don't know what you're talking about. And it would go back and and just end the end the transaction there. But this is this is all the technology that we used. Again, no code in the background. We used the wizard to create this base API. And then we just did drag and drop decision nodes and switch cases in the background. One of the things you also have to be concerned about uh, when you're making APIs is who's going to handle the air conditions. The air conditions from the application or the air conditions from the call have to be handled somewhere, somehow. Are you going to, are you going to have your consumers do that for every API and every consumer has to change every API if, if there's one change, or you're going to let your API smart API manager uh, do that. So we also get, we give you the ability to inter interrogate the uh, air conditions. People get a warning and they say it's okay. Some people get an error and we want to put the error back to the front end. Or we could do is we can customize the error to prevent to present the front end with a more logical uh, error message as opposed to what we're used to seeing in the green screen. We also give you the ability to change the logic flow of the API based on the error. So it's, it's a very powerful thing depending on the situation that's coming back. 3270 transactions, okay? Um, I often ask people how they do 3270 transaction APIs and 
basically the answers I get is well, we're not because we can't. Well, 3270 B BMS, here's some of the complexities and, and the issues that we run into. Some of the BMS macro um, fields that people have uh, front ends and they don't know how to handle them with, uh, with any programming language. So we, we take these into consideration and we have ways, ways to um, handle this as if the BMS map uh, was presented to uh, the application from a screen. Non-BMS. Well, now you don't have the BMS names to, to do. How do you handle fields represent, re referenced by position? We give you the ability to reference the field by position, but also to rename it to something that you understand and the front end would understand. Again, potential um, multiple screens, unknown issues with screen fields. Here's another one of our customers. It is a organization that does benefits administration for um, the union out in Los Angeles. And they had an issue where they had all these, these screens and they wanted to present it to a front end and they couldn't couldn't figure out a way to create it by using programs. So they came to us, uh, we've created, we created uh, APIs for them. And it's interesting with the, with the COVID um, pandemic that we're having now, we actually talked to uh, one of, the, I think it was one of the senior directors, our, our sales guys uh, talked to him. And he said, you can't believe how valuable this has been to us during the crisis because now all of their, all of their um, call centers and everything were shut down and people couldn't just walk into the organization, the administration organization and get the information. But by being able to do it online, people were uh, thrilled that they could still find their information during the pandemic. Here's a, uh, a view of the one I was mentioning from the uh, airline. Uh, this, is, this is kind of interesting because this is multiple APIs getting information between the registration number or the, 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 the nose number they call it, uh, the type of equipment it is. Here you can see that it's 15 hours on ground. This is a maintenance application that they do. And what it's telling us is here's all the stuff that either needs to be done, has already been done, and they have to decide where they're going to do the work. Are they going to do the work here when it's down the ground 54 minutes? Or are they going to do it here when it's down the ground for 15 hours or 12 hours? But in order to do that, they have to make sure they have the right parts here and here or wherever they're going to do the maintenance. So the, the uh, integration of all their applications that they would, or their transactions, they would do green screen, go here, green screen, go here, and try to, try to match it up. It's all on one Google tablet now for them. And they've done it using our smart API technology. Design methodology, and we talked a little bit about this. How do you want to design, design your API? your structure of your API. Um, what we have found is that the best way for organizations to do this is to create what we call base services or microservice. And that is, it, it's closely matching a one-to-one -one between the service and the transaction. And the reason we do this is because, because then you can re use that single service over and over again as opposed to redoing it if you, if you do it uh, every time in a complex. Because in the composite or smart APIs, as part of it, we can call these base services one at a time. We can call them. So by having a base service, you're able to have a microservice of an individual function or transaction. However, when you need to put it out to the front end, who needs multiple transactions, you're able to do that by calling the base services through Ivory. Here's just a little picture to um, go over what we did, we've already talked about. You can have your app server or your, your ESB up here, an API manager. 
you can have uh, a, an ivory server running, or I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you create a composite API, which can call base APIs from anywhere. It could call it from here, can call it from there, can call it from an external app. Interesting um, thing we had happen at the airline is we created an API that would update data in their system for multiple multiple instances. The API would just keep running over and over with new data each time because we we can we can effectively um, put more data in the in the transaction each time we run it, different data. And it was running so fast that that when they went to do a get after you know four or five uh, attempts that were getting not found. And the reason was is because the ivory server was running those transactions or calling those transactions and IMS was running them so fast that they didn't have time to update the data. So what they had to do is before each call to update that data, they wrote a Java program that basically said sleep for, for 50 milliseconds. And then we were able to get past that issue. It was kind of interesting that um, we're so we were so quick for them. They also ran into a problem out there, is that they they want to update parts. Said it said a part that they're getting now is from Boeing, and it used to be from Lockheed before. So now they have to update their parts records. Well, that's fine and dandy by doing that with a with a green screen, because you're doing one at a time. But what happens when you update an engine which has ten thousand parts? Well, now the, the people that have the front end tablets now, and they're doing their testing, is they would hit it, they would hit the Google tablet. A few seconds later, they said, ah, that didn't work. And they hit it again, and they hit it again. And the IMS lady came over and yelled at us because they ran 60,000 transactions in three minutes because they kept hitting the, uh, the submit button. Finally, we convinced them to gray out the submit button uh, when they did it the first time. But just some of the things that we run into along the way. Uh, as you can see here, uh, we are talking about ZOS, VSE, or even Z Cloud, any mainframe. Um, we're actually, with Kix, we're actually um, close to um, other platforms that, that Kix runs on. And I'm working on that right now, which is, which is a lot of fun. Here's, a, here's, here's our studio. The I, Ivory comes in, there's two pieces to Ivory. There's the Ivory Studio. And there's the Ivory server. The studio is where you develop the APIs, you deploy them to the server, and the server is the one that actually does the processing and the calling to the, the re remote systems. Um, here we talked about drag and drop, no coding, because uh, we do not do any coding. Under the covers, we create some um, format data formatted that the server understands, but there's really no code that you have to, you have to write or maintain. You can do multiple transactions, as you can see here. This is actually a um, API that was created for a European bank. They had a situation where somebody, one of their account holders, wanted to buy stock, and they couldn't. You know, they didn't know how many shares of stock they could buy. They call into a call center. Lay at the call center, the person at the call center would run a run a uh, transaction, which we, we could create a common area, but they, they obviously they did it with the terminal at the time. They run a transaction to get the account, all right, get the account number. Then we come in and say, is the account number valid? Yes or no? If it's not, we put out an error message and we come down here saying name not found, record not found or whatever. If it is, we'll go out they would have to go out to, to a stock trading app and they, they'd find out what the um, current stock price is. Then they have to go back to a 3270 screen to see how much um, our account. And then they'd take a piece of paper and a, and a calculator and calculate how many, how many um, shares of stock this person can purchase. Well, with the Ivory, they are able to combine all this in a single API where we get the account number, check it, call out to the uh, stock service, see how much money they got, do the calculation for them, 
and then put out, you can buy X number of shares. They now allow their customers to do this by themselves online as opposed to having to call or go into a bank and run four different processes to get, to get the information. And as you can see, we have the conditional logic. We have error handling down here. We do arithmetic and string functions, which is in here, uh, where we find out how many shares of stock they can buy. Governance and security, whatever security you're using today, you use when you use Ivory. The call to external web service APIs. And it's actually an agile type development because if I wanted to change, change something in here, I'd make the change, deploy it, test it. Make the change, deploy it, test it. It's, it's really quick. And once you deploy it and it runs, it's available to uh, somebody to call as long as they know the URI. We talked about the server basically. Uh, the server can run either as a, if you're running ZOS, it can run on ZOS to start a task. It can run on IFL. Um, we don't care what version uh, of Linux. It can run on Windows or Linux server. Um, the airline runs on uh, Linux server. We have other customers who run on Windows server. Actually, we have, a cu we have um, customers that run on uh, pretty much all of these. And again, we talk about, we can go to Z Cloud, we can go uh, VSE, external 3270. Some of the new and upcoming things, um, or they may not be so new anymore, um, AI, blockchain, business intelligence, anything that needs a smart API or an API, all they have to do is hook in and call the Ivory. We can orchestrate everything to whatever application you need, other resources. Um, if you have ZOS Connect, um, we can, and you already created, well, you wouldn't have ZOS Connect on VSC, but if you happen to have a ZOS on your, in your environment and you, and you had ZOS Connect, if you happen to have already created some, we can orchestrate them. Um, let's see. Okay, I'm gonna try to do a, a fairly quick demo. Uh, I realize that uh, it is Friday afternoon. Let me see. As soon as I can find my window. Oh, there it is. Okay, this is the Ivory Studio we talked about. And I'll just go a real, real quick, um, real quick, I'll show you how to create a common area API. It could be either SOAP or REST, whichever you want to use. It could be a combination of both. Uh, we've had some people create APIs with SOAP and the front end wanted REST and we just put a, a REST wrapper around the SOAP API and, and they, were, they were happy. Come up here, you just say new project, new project wizard, REST. I'm gonna do a Kix.com area. Uh, let's see. And what do we wanna call this? Just call it demo, how's that? And if you look here, uh, description, you actually can put documentation in there. And um, that'll be um, in HTML form. Do the REST service operation. Oops, let's put the resource path. And then you need to know the copy books. The copy books can either be downloaded to your local file system or you can. Um, FTP them directly from your mainframe, whatever uh, format you have them in, whether it's librarian or, or whatever. Uh, I happen to have it on my on my system here. And then this window will pop up. And as you can see, it truly is, truly is just a Cobalt copy book. So you import it. And now if you had a different copy book for output, you could uh, you could put it here. You can import that here, but we're using the same same copy book. And our CICS program. Now here's where we're, we um, 
a little bit different from some is that we don't make you pass back the entire copy book. To run this, this uh, application, all they need is first name and last name. And if you can see over here at the service input, it kind of squashes down the COBOL name, but front ends don't like those names, so you can name whatever you want. And then we'll go for our output, move to output node. Also, we really want to come back because we want the account number. And we'll, we'll bring back the first name last time. That's okay. I'm not going to change, change the names here just uh, for expediency. And then if I hit finish, I now have a working API. I'm going to deploy this. And hopefully our ZOS people didn't screw us up. And we do a test. And for REST, we use the Open API test tool. For SOAP, we have an integrated test tool into the project or into the uh, product. We have to put our input string. Taking longer to test than did to create it. As you can see, we returned in JSON format the three three fields that we asked. And that's that's basically how you create a, um, a base service or a microservice. And then we could go in here and we can use the toolbox here and do some decision or switch cases or function. We could do looping, um, whatever you need, whatever you need to complete your business process. Are there any questions on this? Okay. So, in summary, you really have to look out for any hidden gotchas because of the um, decades old legacy and how they're integrated. What we, what we tout and what we uh, provide to our customers is a no code, low code integration tool where you don't put the onus of uh, doing smarter APIs, composite APIs on the consumers. You do it with our, our tool, which is, um, like I said, no code, zero code, drag and drop. The existing applications don't even know if there's change and there's no changes to the legacy code and we can run on or off the mainframe. Uh, in a VSE world, we would run in a Windows or Linux or, or Xlinux environment. Um, we could do a hybrid. Um, made from applications, you could be both uh, consumer and uh, providers. Um, and we do real main time mainframe integration. We don't uh, we don't do close to or whatever. Um, we actually run the, the application on the mainframe and get the data back at that point. All right. Um, we've actually been around since uh, 1982. Um, I'm, some of you may have heard of our BMS uh, project or BMS GT to create BMS maps. Uh, that was our original project. Um, like I said, we've helped uh, organizations in all facets of um, transportation and, and banking and insurance and um, everything. And that's about it. Is there any questions anybody wants to, uh, to ask? So any questions for Glenn, uh, put them in the chat or you can unmute and, and uh, share them. All right. I have, yeah. a, I have a question. Yes. 
Are you, uh, are you doing uh, any work at the... Uh, you do many work at uh, Washington University at, with Ivory right now? Washington State University? And... Uh, not that I'm aware of, but no. I'm one of, I'm one of, uh, I'm not the only SC, so. Okay. All right. But if you, if you do have any other questions to you, my email's right there. It's very simple. Okay. Uh, you can just send, you. Me, send me an email. All right. All right. Well, thank you very much, Glenn. As a, a ZVM guy, uh, I don't get in this space too much. So you, you definitely <laughs> did a few things and I appreciate it. Well, Bill, I, I started out in uh, my sister's programming days in 1981 as VM, so I hear you. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.